our Members of Parliament, is presented by Rogers Community 4, Surrey. Hello, I'm Archie Miller in Ottawa, our nation's capital. The Parliament buildings behind me are where so much of how we govern our lives is determined. For those of us from BC, Ottawa sometimes seems a world away, an entity unto itself, making a series of diverse decisions on such things as the GST Free Trade and the Young Offenders Act. Well, Ottawa is not a thing but a place with people we elect making those decisions. But how can we as taxpayers influence the deliberations, have a say if you will, into the decisions that are made here on the Hill? Well, the easiest way is through our members of Parliament that represent our communities. These MPs are representatives for us. Their responsibility is to take our views and concerns here in Ottawa, and in return, they're to keep us informed of the ideas, the debates and decisions that are coming from the nation's capital. On this program, we'll look at the role of our MPs and how we can gain access to them. We'll also share some thoughts on the future of federal politics in Canada. Please stay with us for the next hour as we present our members of Parliament. Government's got to get out of the business of running small business at all. I'll get 15 minutes on it. You may be on television now. <laughs> government gets its money in the first place. A little, uh, a little more active. What's, uh, what's happening? Well, there's a complete new change of schedule in the office. about our members of parliament, your elected federal representative. Research shows that the average Canadian really doesn't have a clear understanding of what our politicians do. Yet these people's decisions and actions can directly affect all of our lives. So the question is, why don't Canadians get more involved in politics? Possibly because we feel that as an individual, we won't be able to make a difference. But each of us can make a difference. And one of the best ways to do this is to stay informed. That's the goal of this program, to inform you of the role of members of Parliament and to let you know how you can gain access to them. It is important to note that our members of Parliament make up only one part of our federal governing system. The executive is made up of the Prime Minister, the leader of the political party which has the most elected representatives, and cabinet ministers, usually from the same party, which look after specific departments of government. Together, these people propose legislation. They present budgets to Parliament. They are, in fact, what most people refer to as the government. Next, the legislature is made up of the Senate, an appointed body, and the House of Commons, our elected members of Parliament, which is where all of Canada is represented. They are responsible for voting on new laws, among other things, proposed by the government. And finally, the judiciary, which consists of the Supreme Court of Canada and our legal system, which carries out the laws. As our elected representatives in Ottawa, our members of Parliament become our voice in Canada's national forum. 80,000 per year. Canadians are not getting good value for their tax dollars in a system, in a system that, has that has serious and occasionally fatal flaws. I ask the Parliamentary Secretary, when can Canadians expect a correction system that works for them? instead of for the criminal. Here, here. One person who is in constant contact with all our MPs is the Speaker of the House of Commons. His job is to oversee the procedures and ensure that all MPs follow the rules of procedure known as the standing orders. We met with Gib Perron, the current Speaker of the House of Commons, and asked him to explain the role of a member of Parliament. In a nutshell, it's to represent the people uh, who send them here. He or she 
uh, is the voice uh, of the people of his or uh, her constituency. So uh, they have a very um, onerous task, a great responsibility to see to it that they absorb all of the information and the opinions coming out of their writings, and they are able to articulate um, these particular uh, views here on the floor of the House of Commons. And most of the men and women here are really uh, quite, uh, quite good in, at speaking. As a matter of fact, I have heard it said that if you can uh, make a speech on the floor of the House of Commons with even minor heckling, you can speak anywhere in the world. The dictionary definition of an MP is the person elected in each federal constituency to represent his or her constituents in the House of Commons. What does this representation consist of? Well, think of the MP's job as involving the three C's. The constituency, also known as the riding or area an MP represents, the commons, and the committees. Responsibilities in the constituency include direct involvement with members of the community, known as constituents. MPs work towards keeping constituents informed of events in Ottawa through town hall meetings and newsletters known as householders. MPs work to bring national attention to local issues and also introduce proposals in the House of Commons to change laws that affect their constituents. This brings us to their responsibilities in the House of Commons. The House of Commons is the stage upon which our members of Parliament make local concerns known to other MPs and through the media and the parliamentary channel to the rest of Canada. In the Commons, an MP asks questions of the Cabinet Ministers, the members of the government in power who look after certain areas, such as Minister of Finance or Health and Welfare. In the Commons, MPs also make statements on issues of local or national concern and debate proposed laws known as bills that the government has introduced. The House of Commons is where your MP becomes your eyes and ears, ensuring that the government takes into account the needs of all of Canada when laws are passed and decisions are made. The third area of responsibility for an MP is involvement in committees, smaller groups of MPs which meet to discuss details on specific issues to be debated in the House of Commons. Committees allow MPs to divide the work and to specialize in certain areas that interest them. For instance, a farmer might want to serve on the Agriculture Committee or a lawyer on the Justice Committee. In general, members sit on at least two committees. Committee work requires members to read background documents and meet experts in the field, including lawyers, economists, special interest groups, business persons, and senior government officials. These three areas of responsibility take up considerable time each week. On top of this, MPs must make time for the media, whether it's for a television appearance on CBC News World or a quick interview with a newspaper reporter. Our MPs must spend time each week ensuring that the issues that they are concerned about are known to others. The media is usually more than happy to pass on an important story or a controversial statement. Our MPs also spend time each week doing their own research, either on the phone or with the help of a staff assistant. Some of the MPs that we met had 60 to 70 hour work weeks. When we asked them why they put so much time into their jobs, the answer was simple, because that's what it takes to do the job properly. There are currently 295 members of parliament in Canada. Each represents a particular riding, an area with specific boundaries in which the majority of voters have elected that individual to represent them in Ottawa. Ridings do not necessarily follow city or municipal boundaries and are generally determined to encompass a similar population. That is why some cities have a number of MPs, while sparsely populated rural areas may encompass thousands of square kilometers in a single riding. On this program, we are looking at the members of parliament that represent the areas of New Westminster, Surrey, Langley, White Rock, and the Fraser Valley. All were elected for the first time in October 1993 and represent the Reform Party. The riding of Surrey, White Rock, South Langley is represented by Val Meredith. In the 1970s, Val was a town councillor and later mayor of the community of Slave Lake, where she owned and operated a flower and gift shop. She was a founding member of the Reform Party of Canada and was part of the original National Executive. She is a member of the Justice and Legal Affairs Standing Committee and the Subcommittee on National Security and currently serves as the Solicitor General Critic for the Reform Party. 
I'm here to represent the community, and if I don't reach back into the community and talk to people, either individually or as a group, to find out what their concerns are, what they want me to do, what they, you know, what message they want to deliver to Ottawa, then why am I here? So I think it's extremely important that I go back to my constituency and that I make myself available. Surrey North's MP is Margaret Bridgman. Trained as a registered nurse, she was also involved in hospital senior management before entering politics. Margaret was a board member and later president of the Surrey North constituency before she became a Reform Party federal candidate in September 1993. When I first came, I thought, oh my goodness, how am I ever going to, you know, get on top of all this? And, you know, one year later, it's a thrilling job. There is so much going on that uh, you wish you could clone yourself twice just to, you know, uh, get all this data and, and, and that, but you can't possibly uh, do uh, everything with it. Fraser Valley West is served by Randy White. Randy is a certified management accountant with experience in the Royal Canadian Air Force, Alberta Energy and Northern Canada Power Commission, and the Abbotsford School District. Randy is an associate member of two standing committees, Procedure and House Affairs and Public Accounts, and a member of the subcommittees on electronic voting and private members' business. I have to show something for my five years here. Uh, so it's important to me to, to uh, try to give the confidence back to the people of our community that I'm, I, I was worth electing. You know, the, the opinion of politicians is so low, it's dreadfully low. And uh, it is nice to hear from the people who say, hey, you're doing a good job, but that to me isn't enough. I have to, I have to somehow get on a mission of proving that, that these positions are worthwhile. They can do something for you. And uh, so, so that's the objective. And my community, uh, I owe it to them. New Westminster Burnaby is represented by Paul Forsyth. With a Bachelor of Education and a Certificate of Public Administration, Paul served as a probation officer and family court counselor under the Provincial Attorney General's Corrections Branch for over 20 years. Formerly the Reform Critic for Justice, Paul is currently the Environment Critic. Part of the environment people have to understand is in the world of politics, it's, you might say, conflict resolution at the national level. So as soon as I put on a label of a political party, there's another party down the street who wants to make me look bad because they want to be elected instead of me. So you understand that there's that game of misrepresenting someone else's point of view and the oppositional conversation. So people got to understand that, that that's the day-to-day -day cut and thrust of vying for public attention and public trust. Fraser Valley East is the riding of Chuck Strahl, a partner in a successful road construction and logging contracting firm since 1976 Chuck also runs a hobby farm. Prior to the 1993 election, he represented the Reform Party on a speaking tour of Ontario and was the provincial representative on the Reform Party's national campaign strategy team. During the first sitting of the House of Commons, Chuck served as assistant caucus coordinator and is currently the reform critic on public service renewal. There comes a time when you finally just say, you know, you either sit at home and throw bricks at the television set or or sometimes you just have to get out and you have to uh, make some noise yourself. And so I decided that there was enough issues on the table at this stage of my life that I just had to say, I'm, I'm going to try to make a difference. And, uh, and so that's when the hat went in the ring and the rest, as they say, is history. Do you think you have what it takes to become a member of parliament? Do you wonder about the process of getting elected and becoming a federal representative? Well, any Canadian citizen who is at least 18 years of age on polling day is eligible to be a candidate at an election unless specifically disqualified under the Canada Elections Act. Someone wishing to become a candidate must appoint an official agent and obtain a nomination paper for the electoral district in which they wish to run. The nomination paper must be signed by at least 100 persons who are qualified to vote in that electoral district and duly witnessed. Of course, it's a long road to, uh, to even get a nomination for a party, and then you have to uh, develop community support and fight an election, and then win that election, and then uh, participate in the caucus that you're a part of to uh, establish a community voice and to fulfill the obligations that you campaigned on. 
candidates who are endorsed by a particular political party, usually decided at a local nomination meeting, must also forward a letter of endorsement from the party leader. The completed documents must be submitted a minimum of 28 days before the election and accompanied by a deposit of $1,000. Candidates then use signs, banners, brochures, personal appearances, and even televised debates in their campaign to convince voters that they are the best choice to represent the people of the riding as their member of parliament. And how did your election go? Oh, mine went all right. I got 49% of the vote. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen the next time, but uh, we did all right. We were very confident and, uh, and committed to what we were doing. And uh, we always had the philosophy that uh, we go out and we don't, uh, we don't downgrade the efforts of other candidates. We put our proposals forward, and that's it. You know, we keep integrity number one. And I think that had a large part to do with it. My election went very well. Uh, we were very successful. We uh, led the polls by about, I, my recollection is 8,000 votes. And we ran a very good campaign, a very strong campaign. But I was in the process of, of campaigning probably for a year and a half to two years. So it is a tremendous amount of work. Oh, it's a, a real commitment. Um, you give up your time if you have a business or in a business or in a profession and you certainly give up uh, private time, family time, in order to do that. Ottawa, our nation's capital, was chosen as the capital of the province of Canada in 1857 and confirmed as the new country's capital ten years later upon Confederation. Parliament Hill is a majestic site located on a cliff overlooking the Ottawa River. Rebuilt after a fire destroyed the original buildings in 1916, the complex encompasses the two Houses of Parliament, the Senate to the right of the Centre Block and the House of Commons on the left. Dominating the site is the Peace Tower, built to commemorate Canada's contribution to the First World War. The only building to survive the 1916 fire was the library, which still displays the rich architecture and detailing of an earlier era. I hadn't seen Parliament Hill since I was a teenager. I, I came here on a holiday and I hadn't been back. And you know, you come around the corner and you look up at the Peace Tower and, and uh, the flags are waving and, the, and really and you think, you know, this is where I'm going to work for the next four or five years. It, it's it's a really a humbling thing, you know. It, it, you go in and I sat in the House of Commons about, about the chair that I have now and, uh, you know, I went in there all by myself, frankly, and just sat there and looked around and I thought, you know, this is, this is really, really something to be here and representing a lot of people and a, a, with a lot of uh, big expectations placed on uh, the Reform Party and on me personally. So it was, you know, it was uh, humbling and, and a little intimidating, that's for sure. One of the first duties of a new MP is to travel to Ottawa to set up an office and staff and to learn the ropes of the position they now occupy. There are orientation meetings, an audience with the Prime Minister, meetings with their party leader and other members, and discussions of what specific role or assignment they might receive. I think the initial responsibility, uh, and not just because we were a new, uh, or are a new party, was to actually get organized as a caucus here, get our offices set up, um, find out, uh, you know, where the meeting areas are, where, you, where the caucus room is, where your leader's offices are, that sort of thing. And as a new party, and, and a rookie MP, of course, uh, the very next thing was to get familiar with the uh, procedural aspects of the House, like uh, uh, learn the standing orders as quickly as possible to know how, what decorum to use in the House. Our MPs, obviously, and of necessity, spend a great deal of time away from home to be here in Ottawa. But they do have those homes, the constituencies which they represent even though they might have an office on the hill. The office in the constituency is still very important. And while the telephone and fax machine do afford a great deal of access, nothing beats personal contact. And so our MPs in a country as large as Canada 
seemed to spend a great deal of time going back and forth from Ottawa to meet with the constituents at home. This is a business. I come here from my writing uh, basically Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday each week. I fly home on Thursday night and I work Friday and Saturday mornings in the riding and I fly back on Sunday night. And uh, I treat it like a business. I am a consultant and I go to Ottawa and I do the best I can for the people. Then I go home and I get a good read on what's going on. So traveling between Ottawa and their home riding, especially for MPs who live on either coast, can often become a tedious and expensive routine. Living and working 2,000 miles away from family and friends can bring on a feeling of isolation and loneliness. In addition, MPs must be visible and aware of issues in their riding. Their responsibilities and duties to their constituents on a local level, combined with the need to be in Ottawa for key meetings, debates and legislation, means that some MPs spend over 20 hours per week in travel. I don't have it too bad, you know, being in Surrey, because I fly to Vancouver, get off the plane and drive to Surrey. But people that uh, say Prince George or where they have to get off, or the island, they get off the plane, they've got another plane uh, to catch. Uh, one of the MPs, I don't know if it was Mike Scott from Skeena, mentioned that he has an overnight where he actually can get off the plane here. So sometimes it's not even worth going back for a weekend. Well, I'm spending, oh, maybe 11, 12, 15 hours a week uh, on a plane every week. And uh, because of the three-hour time difference, it can be a problem. I, you just cope with it as best you can. Uh, that's the job. I'm not complaining. Uh, I, I work very hard to be able to serve my community in that, that capacity. So the day I start whining and complaining about long hours and all this, then, then, uh, then it's the time to get out. One of the challenges of being an MP is having limited time to enjoy the comforts of home. And once back in the community, the responsibilities in Ottawa do not end. Thanks to the invention of the cellular phone, there is no escape from the call of duty. Brandy White's office. Hi, it's me. Hi. How are things in Ottawa? Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> Everything's fine. Yeah. Two calls. Okay. Um, David Cameron, he's a graduate student at Carleton University. Yeah. He was calling about uh, your Fraser Valley West Resolution number 17. Okay. Wh which one is that? That's the constitutional reform bill. Oh, yeah. Okay. He wanted to speak to someone further about that, so I didn't know who to uh, refer him to. Okay. Uh, just leave the, uh, just give his phone number to uh, Brenda in the uh, constituency office. Okay. 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 I'll pass that on to Brenda. Yeah. And I'll, uh, if she gets it, I'll uh, call her. Okay. And then, uh, um, I'll get back to him anyway today. Yeah, okay then. Located in 295 communities across the country are the MPs' constituency offices. Some MPs refer to them as constituents' service centers. The constituency office is the main link between the MP and the constituents, the residents of the MPs' electoral area. This office is usually located near the heart of the community and is a place where anyone with a concern, a question or a problem can walk in off the street for some advice, for some assistance or perhaps an answer. These requests can range from the very obvious and simple to the very complicated and emotional. In some cases the staff of the office will deal with the situation or perhaps offer referrals to another appropriate agency. In other cases, the MP might become directly involved, sometimes taking the issue all the way to Ottawa. The staff of these offices are therefore of paramount importance, as in the absence of the MP, they are that person's representative. Well, the constituency staff here basically look after all the major problems. Uh, I don't meet individuals unless they specifically want to talk to their MP or if my staff feel that they can't deal with the problem or can't solve the problem and that it might need my uh, intercession, my getting involved to, uh, to get resolution to the problem. So my staff here generally carry on the whole show. As with the office on Parliament Hill, the constituency office must be up on all that is going on. 
the Ottawa office concentrates on the daily activities of the Hill, while the constituency office focuses on local affairs. But both keep closely in touch with each other. The members of Parliament that we talk to all seem to emphasize the importance of listening to constituents. How would you describe your responsibilities here in the constituency? Uh, in the constituency, in a nutshell, it's um, being available and data gathering because the the bulk of the, of the um, the work where you actually have the um, you know some effect is done in Ottawa with the debating, the legislating, and, and that kind of thing. So you need the data or the input uh, to get that you know to set yourself up to do that so that's the big thing is getting that data in speaking with randy white at his local office he further emphasized the importance of listening to constituents as i say i have to go to ottawa and i have to put my best foot forward for the issues that concern the people here and uh, I, I think what is paramount in my mind is I really have to do the job for the people here in the community. There's little point in me being a yes man in the Reform Party or anywhere else. I've got to go with the issues that the people give to me from this community, and I've got to go fight for them, and that's what I do. Whether they're popular or unpopular is irrelevant to me. Uh, I, I go armed to the teeth with the best information I have from this community, and I fight for it. Some issues can be identified as having national importance or interest, or require further government action to provide an answer. We want to be able to help you and pass your bill C-240. Okay. And um, we, as a group of citizens, would like to know how we can best do that for our member of parliament. Well, I think, you know, you've heard me speak at the, uh, the rally, and I, you know, I think the most effective way, of, of course, is by letters, a letter campaign. Mm -hmm. um, Chuck Cadman, with his cryo organization, has been very successful in bringing attention to parliamentarians, the need to, uh, you know, redo or rethink the Young Offenders Act. And I think that it's very effective to have thousands of letters mm -hmm. uh, hit the Justice Minister, the Solicitor General's uh, uh, minister, their desk. The other way, of course, is petitions, getting people to sign a petition. Um, it's one way that people can feel that they have a say, and that's yeah. often a very effective way, too. We petitions are presented, of course, into the House of Commons, and so not only do you educate the, the public when you're getting them to sign the petition, and it gives them a chance to respond, mm -hmm. but it also brings attention to it when it's introduced into the House of Commons. Well, I can assure Something. you, you will be getting your letters, and okay. not only will you be getting the ones the Member of Parliament can bring these issues and questions from the riding back to Ottawa to be discussed in party caucus meetings, committee meetings, and if warranted, in the House itself. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks Thank you. For in. Bye now. Bye now. Bye, now. Bye, John. While the constituency office is the front line at home, the office in Ottawa is involved in the MP's day-to-day -day hectic routine on the Hill. These offices offer a high level of communication, room to meet with staff, guests, occasionally visitors from the constituency, and maybe even family and friends. These offices also have areas to write and do research. In the parliamentary office, what we do is all those legislative things that are part of the job. Uh, I will deal with correspondents, people who send letters here raising all kinds of concerns from GST problems to immigration problems. Most of the immigration problems and the, those kinds of problems will be handled at the constituency level, but I do get the odd one in this office. Most of the, the correspondents that I get here will deal with uh, government legislation that people want changed, um, justice reform that they want to see happen. We do private member work on private members' bills. Um, you know, if we feel that there's an issue that we want to advance, uh, that's where we would do it as, as members of Parliament. It is through these offices that the MP's day-to-day -day life is determined, scheduled, and maintained. Issues coming from government at home or elsewhere in Canada are researched through these offices, using a variety of materials and resources, including the Parliamentary Library. These are very busy and efficient places, and the MPs readily agree that their lives would be very difficult, if not impossible, without them. Uh, it's, it's absolutely key to be a successful Member of Parliament is to have good staff. 
you know, more, most of the time I'm on the run, you know, and so I'm going from a committee to a to question period to a speech to to a caucus meeting to, you know, meeting, talking with the press to whatever, a policy, all these things are going on. Meanwhile, there's an awful lot of work that's being expected of the staff. That they, you know, someone will get a hold of me and they'll say there's a problem with my, any of those problems I mentioned before, I have a UI problem and my appeal isn't gone through, I wonder why. Well, I'll, I'll say I'll look after that, but you know, an awful lot of it, frankly, is not looked after by me personally. I'll make sure it gets done, but it's, I hand it off to, to Duncan or Lori or Tomiko or Jillian and I say, uh, you know, this guy, it sounds to me like he's got a real problem with, uh, with this level of the bureaucracy. Could you uh, phone a couple of people and see what, where their appeal is, what the status is, for example? And uh, if that's done well, and if you have people that communicate well in your staff, I mean, it, they just move mountains. They just, uh, they make the difference between, I would suggest, between making an MP's life livable and, and just, uh, just being in a constant turmoil. You'll, you'll want to respond to. Okay. And so here's a couple more of these um, more personal ones. Well, one was a chain letter. Chain letter. Mm -hmm. that if you don't pass said, this on. said to kiss someone and make magic and so on. And so I thought <laughs> I'd just better ditch that one. Uh, this one is. I interface with the media when they call to, to uh, set up interviews. Um, I also end up editing his speeches. We have kind of a unique system where Dave provides the background. Uh, then Paul usually writes most of his own speeches, and then I, I cut and chop. And he doesn't always like what I do, but uh, as far as uh, giving, it's almost like giving up a child if he has to take, if I have to take out a paragraph or something. But uh, it works quite well, and, and I have done some writing for him as well. Each year, the MPs look into, discuss, and research a vast number of ideas and suggestions. Of these, a number deemed to be of importance, validity, relevance, and in some cases of simple interest, will be taken further into the process. This will entail much more discussion and research to a point where the issue is written out and presented, tested, if you will, among the MP's colleagues. Many full-time appointees are ill-prepared to do the job, much less the part-timers. Will the minister promise to put an end to political patronage on the National Parole Board and introduce a system based solely on professional skills and merit? Right on. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's, it's a little bit okay. long, um, but he's, I, I, If the item passes this hurdle, it will then encounter a whole new set of procedures to follow. More research, discussion, debate, uh, and presentation. Very, I'll get a hold of him on that. I was just going to check with Often the best of intentions are simply not enough and an issue may not even make it to the House of Commons. It must be remembered by the constituents and the MP that the many and varied procedures which are encountered will greatly restrict what can be done. I think when you first come into it, you, you're motivated either because you've always wanted to be a politician or you've, you've seen things that you don't like and you want to put yourself in a position to maybe help try and change them. And I think initially you don't really realize how difficult it is to affect change. There's, it's a, it takes a lot more work than what you actually thought, or a lot more time than what you actually thought. And I think that becomes a challenge. Once an issue has been researched and discussed at a party meeting, an MP can bring the issue to the House of Commons in hopes of creating a new law known as a bill. It is in the House of Commons that our MPs meet to debate and pass proposed laws and to discuss issues of local, regional or national importance. The result is often a public clash of proposals and personalities as MPs fight for what they feel is best for their constituency and party. Any MP, whether a member of the party in power or not, can introduce a private member's bill in hopes of seeing it become a law. Members bill in this house that we are debating right now that will deal with this issue. The Liberal Red Book states that as a government they will introduce measures to protect women and children. This government has failed to protect Pamela Cameron, they failed to protect Sarah Kelly in the PAW, and they failed to protect Mindy Tran in Kelowna. Will the minister advise this house? When will the government live up to the Red Book promises and their commitment to? to protect this country's children. In order for a bill to become a law, it must go through certain procedures. 
Each bill is presented three times for questions and discussion. These presentations are called readings. At the first reading, the bill is automatically carried without debate, amendment, or vote. The bill is then given a second reading, at which time members debate the general principle of the bill. Because of the number of bills put forward, it would be impossible for all members of Parliament to examine each bill in depth, particularly as some can be hundreds of pages thick. After second reading, the bill is passed to a committee composed of government and opposition members who examine the bill clause by clause and submit any amendments in a report to the House. At the report stage, other members may move additional amendments. The bill is then presented for third reading, where members have a final opportunity to debate the legislation and any amendments before a vote is taken. If the majority of members in the House of Commons vote to pass the bill, it then goes to the Senate, where a similar process is undertaken. Only after a bill has passed in both the House of Commons and the Senate can it be given royal assent by the Governor-General, passing it into law. Debating and passing bills is only one function of the House. We met with MP Paul Forsyth to further discuss procedures in the House of Commons. What goes on in here? What do we see happening when we watch the Parliamentary Channel? Well, this is the House of Commons, the, 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 the voice of the commoner, where the people's representatives come to give uh, uh, their views uh, on behalf of the people to debate uh, the legislation of the day. Uh, it's where the government comes to give account of itself to get its permission to tax and spend the, popula uh, the population. So um, this is where uh, the ideas are debated and, and the, you might say the, the philosophical end is, is completed. But of course the business of government is outside these buildings in the ministries. But uh, this is uh, the final chamber of authority where the votes are made uh, to carry on the business of the nation. And what is it we don't see in here? What is it we don't get to watch on the parliamentary channel? When someone has been recognized by the chair and they are speaking, it's only their microphone that is open. So the, the, the cat calls and the cheers, the jeers and the jibes from across the way, you may only incidentally hear through that speaker's microphone, but you don't see what's going on. So a lot of the most interesting television, you might say, is always off camera. So that can be frustrating. The purpose of that, of course, is to uh, keep some bounds of decorum in this chamber that really has a chance to get out of control that if we were completely just playing to the cameras, uh, it would be completely unmanageable and perhaps uh, uh, lose all dignity and respect. When the House is in session, a daily schedule is followed to ensure that all members of Parliament are aware of the type of proceedings that will be taking place at any given time. Time is set aside for routine proceedings, which includes the tabling of documents, statements by ministers, presentations of petitions and committee reports, introduction and first reading of bills, and debating of motions. The most closely watched session is that time set aside for oral questions, also known as question period. This 45-minute block each day allows opposition members and sometimes other government members to question the prime minister and cabinet ministers about government actions, proposals, or issues. This often boisterous exchange usually focuses on items of national interest or importance, or calls the government to task for some controversial action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's get the facts straight about the government's compensation report recently tabled in this House. It's business as usual. Although the Conservatives started it, the Liberals could have stopped it but didn't. The initial cost of the report was $150,000 and has escalated to $200,000. It recommended severance pay for all MPs, even though many have jobs to go to after their mandate. It recommended more money for senators, and it recommended a 37% pay increase for MPs. The Liberal Party suggests that MPs deserve a raise because they work so hard. Let's consider ourselves Corporation Canada, and we are its 295 directors. Corporation Canada spends $160 billion a year and loses $40 billion. Do MPs deserve this self-indulgence? No. Balance the budget and we'll talk about it. With so many things happening in the House and 295 MPs trying to give their own constituents a voice, you may wonder how anything is accomplished and exactly how much of a say your MP will have. To ensure order in the House, there is a set of rules called the standing orders, 
and it is the responsibility of the Speaker to ensure that all MPs have their fair say. We met with MP Margaret Bridgman to discuss the impact an individual MP can have in the House. Uh, here in the House, there's the formal way of doing it, and that is actually getting involved in the debate, because the more perspectives that uh, are put out and recorded, the more that goes to committee for a base to work upon when you're addressing that bill. The other thing that you can do uh, here is it's a common area for all MPs, so you can actually, you know, catch up with somebody you've been trying to get hold of and uh, collaborate on or whatever, you know, this kind of thing. So um, you have informal and formal things going on here. During the time that the MPs spend each week in Ottawa, at public and private meetings, at government and party committees, in their offices, in front of the media, or in the House of Commons, they gather information, materials, questions and answers. And aspects of all of this must go back to the constituency at home. Our MPs carry out this important function in a variety of ways coordinated through the constituency office. MPs use newsletters sent door to door, media pieces on radio, TV and in the press, public appearances and community meetings. Through all of these, the MP is communicating the affairs of the Hill, gathering responses from the constituents and entering into often lengthy and animated discussions. Where the MP becomes part and parcel of the, the community and informs the community of issues of the day, but is also there to be informed. And I regularly hold those. I call them accountability sessions or, or whatever. So that it's a, one more method of making the Member of Parliament accessible and also helping me to better be a collective voice of the community. Uh, concerns uh, from, the, uh, from the justice end uh, or a tour with the RCMP or, a, or an, RC, an appreciation banquet for the RCMP, or all those things, those are all events that an MP is welcomed at and also where you get a lot of input on, on how the system's working. So, if I don't get home, if I don't take part in those, then pretty soon uh, I think the word would get out, uh, you know, Strahl's not listening, he, he doesn't know what, I, what my concerns are, he hasn't been able to, uh, I haven't been able to talk to him in six months, you know, where is he? And, and so it's important that you get around. For the MPs, community meetings are a vital link with the electors in their home riding. These meetings range from open forum gatherings where everyone speaks his or her mind and the MP just listens, to very frank give-and-take sessions of argument and debate to the less political luncheons and social functions and simple public appearances. All of these are important as they afford the constituents the opportunity to meet and get to know their MP and for the MP to learn firsthand of their concerns. A successful MP spends as much time as possible with his or her constituents then returns to Ottawa to ensure their constituents get a fair say. We've noticed here as we've been with you that you've been doing a lot of talking to yourself in your office on the speakerphone. Do you ever uh, sit back and think this is kind of a, a strange way to mm -hmm. to live? I mean, you're, you're sitting here talking yeah. to yourself in your office? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a, a world unto itself. Folks, Ottawa has no idea where Abbotsford, Langley and Aldergrove is. Uh, the people here... Uh, the, the government here really doesn't reflect itself in our communities. And it is a world unto itself. And the only way you could keep your head on straight at times as to what the important issues are, are to come here, do your business, get out of here, and get back home and let the people tell you. Our federal government, from its beginnings, has centralized power here. Today, many people, particularly some in B.C., Western Canada, and Quebec, question whether there might not be a better way of doing the nation's business so that more localized specific issues stand a better chance of being addressed. For many years there has been constitutional comment and debate with little change. But with the success of the Reform Party and the Bloc Québécois, the discussions of regionalism might move to the forefront and present many as yet unanswered questions such as how would the government be structured, how would the role of the MP change, would there be regional capitals? And would there still be a federal presence, a government here in Ottawa? What is considered here in Ottawa is central Canada. No question in my mind about that. And that's very discouraging. It's always been the way it was. And, and uh, we've got a, a, a traditional party, one left, 
and uh, I suspect that party will go eventually. Uh, they're so uh, entrenched into traditions like the old way the Senate runs, patronage appointments, spending money they don't have. All of those things are a part of the tradition. Um, and there is no end uh, of that tradition. So somewhere along the line, that's going to have to change. The roots of our federal system of government are deep, but Confederation of Canada in 1867 sets down the rules for, as the Act states, peace, order, and good government. For much of the history of this country, the system was basically two-party, liberal and conservative. But now all that has changed, with other parties espousing different aims and objectives and providing a focus on specific regions of Canada. I think there's a, there's a push on for decentralization for sure, where, where I think the federal government is going to have to be involved in fewer things and, uh, and really devolve a lot of their powers down to the provincial and the municipal levels so that it's more responsive to people's needs quicker. You know, it, it responds quicker and it responds, frankly, better, more in line with with what's needed in Abbotsford, for example, or Chilliwack, and not just what works in Bay Como. Because the, the country's so diverse, it's so different one end to another that, that uh, I think a lot of the programs designed in Ottawa are, don't work well, especially out in the east and west coasts. So I think there will be greater regionalization, and I don't think that's bad. I think, uh, I think as long as the federal government remains a, has, a, has a core of programs and a core of uh, uh, principles that, that it uses, and I think it can still be a unifying force in Canada while devolving those powers to the, to the provincial level where frankly they're, better, they're handled better and are more, are more apt to adapt to the changing circumstances. So regionalism I think will grow but it can still be part of a strong Canada as long as the federal government handles that decentralization properly. Of the MPs we spoke to, opinions on the extent of change varied, but all felt that some change streamlining and fine-tuning would make the entire system more effective and efficient. I think it would be smaller. We're certainly trying to get the federal government uh, out of your pocketbook. And uh, I think, uh, you know, there's a clear division uh, in our charter and in our um, constitution about the division of powers. And uh, there was a time where various provinces did need the assistance of the federal government to uh, develop services and institutions. And now I think it's a time of, of retrenching. Uh, certainly we can make the federal government more responsive by changing some of the machinery of government. But it would be a, a, a leaner, meaner, you might say, more efficient uh, uh, federal government that sticks within its area of competence. And uh, we try and devolve whatever services are given to the lowest practical level possible. If you look at Quebec reaching out, they're, they're not happy with federalism and they they want to separate. Well, we're not happy with federalism, but we want to change the system from within. And I think to some extent there's, there's a, uh, if you can believe it, there's a, a commonality there. They're looking for a different answer, a different solution, but uh, Quebec is frustrated. Atlantic Canada is the same. And if you look at the other issues, like uh, I can see the day when uh, we're going to seriously question having a governor general and the expenses that incurs. Uh, the, the Senate, most people have already said we don't want a Senate. Uh, reform is saying, well, elect a smaller Senate. But those uh, systemic changes are coming to Canada. No question about it. If the system of government was to change to a more regional system, then much would or could be altered. One of these changes would most assuredly be the role of the MP. Discussions have suggested that the MPs might serve on more local and regional councils with occasional meetings on a broader or national level. It's obvious, obviously right now, for example, uh, uh, the federal government's heavily involved in immigration. But if we, if we devolve some of that responsibility as, as we have with Quebec, where we give Quebec more control over their immigration numbers and the type of immigrants and so on, then I would... You know, I would think it would seem natural to me that the role of the MP involved in, in the immigration process will, will be lower from a federal MP's point of view and the provincial concern will rise and, and again because the province is looking for a certain type of individual to be an immigrant with a certain set of qualifications uh, then I would think that that would be transferred to them so the MP obviously is out of that 
is at least cut out of that picture. And I can see many roles, whether it's natural resources, uh, environment, uh, immigration, a lot of them where there may be some federal role, but a, a reduced federal role, and the MP, of course, would take a less of a, less of a high profile in those areas. But whatever the situation, whether regional or a present federal structure, RMPs will continue to represent voters in their constituency, as it has been since Confederation, and as such will continue to play a major role in the deliberations and decisions which affect all of Canada and all of us who reside here. What are the basic characteristics of a good MP? I think the characteristics of a good MP are, is where a person can find the balance. The balance of uh, making an, an impression in the House of Commons, making a difference in the legislation, making sure that the legislation is as good as it can possibly be for Canadians, as well as being a good listener in the, in the writing, a good communicator, somebody who can make sure that you understand what the problems are that your constituents are facing and solve the problems, help resolve the, uh, the problems. I think the strongest MPs uh, are uh, outspoken. They don't worry about getting elected again. Uh, they represent their community as best they can by staying in their community, trying to get that balance we were talking about earlier, uh, trying to uh, represent as best they can the position of their communities. The job of being a member of parliament is, simply stated, difficult. It places in front of the individual a series of challenges which must be met if one is to be both good at the task and do what they were elected to do. We ask them about the rewards of the job to know that people are indeed interested. Um, there is a tendency, I think, be, before I got into this position, I really wondered if anybody really cared, other than, you know, my local group that I, that I would expound to myself or something and, and that kind of thing. And it's really, really rewarding to know that, yes, there, I mean, there are just hundreds and thousands of people out there that are really concerned on what's happening or what could happen to Canada. Yeah, there's nothing better like the satisfaction you get out of helping somebody uh, is really tremendous like uh, I have had a lot of thanks from people when we were uh, after uh, Jose Mendoza for instance the young lady who was sexually assaulted uh, she thanked me one day and I, I I felt very good about that although the uh, some of the the, the people uh, that were supporting a, a liberal kind of point of view we're saying well look at this racist guy he's chasing this El Salvadorian that had nothing to do with it it was trying to get justice done where justice was needed and then at the end of the day getting thanks for it I, I felt really good about that what's the most challenging part of being an MP I think one of the most challenging parts and I'm looking down the road is going to be retaining that uh, human face of retaining the, the person that I am now, that one doesn't get caught up in Parliament Hill and in the Ottawa scene where you forget that you're a servant of the people and start thinking that you are Lord and Master of the House. So I, I think that's the biggest challenge is to maintain the ties with the community, with people, with the ordinary Canadian, so that there's that constant reminder that uh, I'm only passing through and there, there were others before me and there will be others after me. And all I can do is the best that I can for this period of time that I am here representing Surrey, White Rock, South Langley constituents. I think that the members who do hold office can bring uh, uh, respect to the office so that so-called being a member of parliament or a politician is not a negative term. Um, and uh, I think most members of Parliament are very sincere and are very hard-working and, and in the main are, are honest. Uh, I think what happens sometimes to governments and especially government ministers who then get a lot of power, uh, then it's a temptation to um, then favour those who have favoured them. So the more we can make the system open and uh, accountable, then the temptations or the human weaknesses that someone who who may find themselves in a position of, of tremendous power 
uh, they won't be tempted uh, with their human frailties to go over the line. The challenging part, I think, is to, is to see the big picture in the long term. It's so easy to get taken up in, in the question period debate. For instance, you know, like today I must ask a question on one thing, but, but that's just a very small part of a, of a big picture on a long-term basis. If you don't think in terms of during the life of this parliament, what are we going to accomplish? How are we going to steer the government in a new direction? How can we force this huge super tanker called the Canadian government to change course a little bit? Uh, if you lose sight of the big picture, then you, then you can get taken up in the minutia of day-to-day of -day living. And if that happens, uh, I think you lose your effectiveness. I, I already, if I learned one thing in the first year, it would be the fact that it's a, this is a, a marathon, not a sprint. You know, it's a, it's a long-term, steady pressure process that, and big problems aren't solved overnight. Not, not when, when you're the opposition, that's the best you can do is pressure. As we've seen in this program, our members of Parliament are there for us. We vote them in, and they allow us to have a say here in Ottawa. The challenges facing them are diverse. To be an effective MP, they must have a full understanding of the federal system of government, have excellent communication skills, a strong sense of ethics, and the willingness and determination to work for all constituents, supporters and otherwise, in the many matters and issues that will arise. Those attributes are certainly evident in the MPs we've met today, and we want to thank them for taking the time to participate in this program. If you have a question or issue for your Member of Parliament, don't hesitate to contact that individual. Remember, the MPs have offices right in your community, and their prime responsibility is to serve and represent you. I'm Archie Miller. Thank you very much for watching.